joining me for Word Sesh 2. It was a pretty awesome event. Uh, Mr. Scott Bascard and all of his cohorts that are uh, putting this on. I really appreciate it. Um, today, we are going to talk about WordPress theming best practices for client-centric web development. Um, hopefully, you can follow along with the slides that I have attached. Um, we are going to hit a lot of things in this presentation. We've only got uh, 35 to 45 minutes. Um, if you have questions, those of you in the chat, please feel free to uh, uh, to hop in with those. Um, but we've got about one item per minute, so uh, uh, let's let's do it. Um, so my name is Brian Krogsgaard, and I am a WordPress developer. I live in Birmingham, Alabama, um, and I've been doing full-time WordPress development since 2011. Uh, for two years, I worked for a regional uh, development shop in Birmingham called Infomedia, where I got my hands dirty building a lot of websites. And uh, for the past month or so, I've been uh, working with Range. Um, we are uh, a small group of people that do big work, and we have a lot of fun. Uh, and I get to make WordPress themes, so it's a lot of fun. I also run a WordPress news blog that you may be familiar with, I hope so, uh, called Post Status, poststat.us. Um, so with that said, uh, let's talk about building WordPress themes. Uh, first of all, let's talk about structuring uh, your WordPress theme. So uh, there's a lot of things to think about with WordPress themes, and a lot of different people have their own flavor. Um, so your structure really kind of sets the stage for... Uh, how you do everything. Uh, so I would just recommend creating a system that you understand, creating something where organization is key because as you get into bigger and bigger websites with more um, CSS files or SAS files or something, more JavaScript, more images, uh, where you're maybe handling fonts, uh, custom uploaded through the theme, you want to have that organized uh, nice and tight. Uh, you may also keep uh, your sprites and your minified files, that's always good practice. Uh, what I like to do is I like to have the individual images and then I also like to have a sprite uh, for the things that I can sprite. And I also like to have both the regular JavaScript files and the minified files. Um, that way someone that's browsing the code can utilize it, but the code that's used in the theme itself uh, is minified for performance reasons. Um, to, something to consider when you're building your WordPress uh, themes is the template hierarchy. This is one of the uh, first things that I teach to new developers. Um, the template hierarchy's importance cannot be overstated uh, because it really, this is how you tell your WordPress theme what you want to happen with a certain level of priority. Um, so you can get really general, as general as an index.php file, or you can get really, really specific. Um, so you want to be able to balance that out um, and just pay attention to the template hierarchy. So if you have a custom design, say for your category template, um, then obviously you'll want a category uh, file in, uh, and you can utilize the template hierarchy for that. But you want you know, a fallback for that. So archive.php will be a fallback for that. So uh, get to know the template hierarchy, understand how things work, uh, a lot of times when you're debugging a WordPress theme, you'll end up going back on the template hierarchy to realize uh, what's being portrayed on the website. WPHierarchy.com is also a handy little uh, website that uh, has a pretty version of the template hierarchy portrayed. Um, so template parts, uh, your naming conventions and your organization of these template parts, it really depends on the type of person. I personally, uh, I don't often put page templates in their own folder, although that is possible now in the latest version of WordPress. Uh, if I don't have a lot of page templates, I'll use a structure like page dash uh, the name dash template.php. Keep in mind with the template hierarchy, if you do have a page called about and then you create a page template called page dash about.php, uh, that could automatically utilize that template. And I usually like to uh, force the user to select which page template that they are going to use. Um, so that's the naming structure that I tend to use for uh, page templates. If you have a lot, then you can nest them in a folder. 
Um, for partial templates, just use logical and consistent conventions. I recently saw one where it was uh, templates were named T dash something. It was confusing to me. So I usually like to use something like template dash or, or part dash. Um, I prefer part dash something if it's partial uh, templates. And uh, also lean towards smaller templates. So if you have a page.php, you might pull in like a part dash content.php or something like that. Um, and basically, when you're trying to figure out, okay, do I repeat this template or not, just ask yourself, are you repeating yourself? And if you're repeating yourself over and over with the same code and different templates, uh, it's probably wise to make it a template part. And give good and thorough comment blocks at the top of those templates, even if they're partial ones, so that the person that comes in behind you will be able to follow along and know what's going on. Um, so something that can that sometimes comes up with uh, WordPress themes and structure is uh, I'm getting told to speak up a little bit, so hopefully this is a little louder. Uh, so something that comes up sometimes with WordPress themes and structure uh, is whether to hook things in or use templates. Um, and it really depends. People originally started using hooks for actual markup in uh, WordPress themes before things like Git template part uh, were really available. So now people do uh, different methods. Uh, popular themes like Genesis or uh, some others, they really hook in almost everything. Um, but really with Git template part, you can do um, a whole lot. You can, you can break these down into very small templates. Uh, what I like to do is I actually like to have a common hook structure in my theme, especially if it's a parent theme that you are uh, consistently using. So you have one parent theme, and for each project, you kind of use the same parent theme, and you customize your projects with child themes. I actually like to have a hook structure in the layout of my templates, and then I actually like to hook in the template parts with that. Um, that's kind of a hybrid method between the two. Uh, but either way is fine, but the, the point is to consider what you have and, and utilize your code in a way that fits. Uh, one of my pet peeves is to see when someone has a hook available and then they go and they customize the template and they put a call to get template part right next to a hook that was perfectly fine and available so they didn't actually have to override that template. Another thing that I see with... Uh, uh, beginners a lot of times is just really awful code syntax and I'm perfectly guilty of this myself uh, when I was first learning I didn't really understand the importance of code syntax and once you walk into a project that you're unfamiliar with uh, and you weren't the primary developer uh, you will appreciate the difference between a uh, good code syntax and a poor code syntax that's been used uh, so seriously take the time to properly format your code um, nest your HTML as it gets more specific. Um, be thoughtful as you open and close PHP. Follow the WordPress coding standards. Whitespace is your friend. Um, the WordPress coding standards aren't too terribly different from other coding standards, especially from a PHP perspective, but there are some quirks, so, uh, so check those out. Follow them religiously because uh, you'll really appreciate it as you uh, Get, become more experienced as a uh, theme developer. When you're entering and exiting PHP, um, my my thought process is if I'm in functions.php, create a custom function. If I'm in PHP, I like to stay in PHP. So I don't like to close PHP and then you know spit out a bunch of HTML or something. Uh, WordPress is fairly unique in the sense of like there's all this merging of uh, things that display and things that are uh, called via PHP. So I like to keep PHP as PHP. I don't like opening and closing PHP a whole lot in functions.php. If you're in your template files, um, a lot of people think that it's a lot more readable to open and close uh, PHP, and I mostly agree with that. Um, another thing that comes up with template files uh, uh, versus uh, you know, using code in your functions file or your plugins is... Uh, whether to use curly brackets or an alternative syntax for the various control structures like if, else, and you know various loops and whatnot. Um, so here's some links available. I have this throughout the presentation, links to things to read. Um, 
I think Pippin, Williamson, and Tom McFarlane both make pretty excellent points, and there's good conversations in the comments as well about when to use curly brackets, when to use uh, an alternative syntax. I tend to use alternative syntax in templates myself and curly brackets in anywhere where I'm uh, using logic in terms of uh, the code of the, uh, like in a functions file or, or something special. Um, function naming norms, this is something that is uh, pretty important to remember the way that WordPress does it because then when you're creating a custom function for your WordPress theme, uh, you can kind of match that syntax. So typically the way WordPress does it is get the something versus the something. Get the something uh, returns something and then the something uh, is basically a wrapper for get the something and it'll echo it out uh, and then sometimes it'll apply special filters. So a, spe a perfect example is uh, the content versus get the content. The content is just a wrapper really for get the content except for it applies uh, content filters that are special to uh, that function. So when you're doing custom uh, functions for your theme or for your plugin for that matter, uh, try to follow a similar syntax. So it might be post status underscore uh, get the content versus post status the content or you know get the whatever I'm getting uh, out of the database. So try to follow those similar uh, function naming norms. Um, back to code syntax a little bit. Uh, a quick tip on alignment. Um, I've screwed this up for the longest time, I'm sure, and I was wondering why when I pasted something into uh, GitHub or when I uh, you know, committed something and it went into an alternate syntax in terms of uh, how many spaces were in tabs and whatnot, why things got unaligned. And that was because I was using tabs for both nesting and for alignment. So if you're setting up, say, an array of key value pairs, uh, use your tabs for nesting and then use spaces for actually aligning those values. Uh, WordPress core does that and that makes it show up a little nicer uh, when you see that code in someone else's uh, environment. So let's talk about code. Um, and I'm going pretty fast here so I hope you all are following along. Uh, hook order. Uh, understanding the core load, when things happen, when different hooks uh, fire, that is extremely valuable for a WordPress developer so that you know um, when pre-git post fires, you know when uh, template redirect fires, you know when these various hooks fires on a, any given page load. Uh, Rarst has a really handy chart here, uh, slash script slash WordPress core load, where it shows some of these uh, key things in core, WordPress core's uh, loading mechanisms. Uh, that's super helpful. And then if you just want like all the hooks, uh, the codex literally has all the hooks and there's this action, action reference that's just unbelievable to get to know and, and really start to learn these hooks. And I just want to give a special shout out from a theming perspective to template redirect. One of the special things about template redirect is you can do pretty much anything you would do in the early stages of WordPress in terms of uh, nothing's been spit out on the page yet. However, your conditionals are functional at the template redirect hook. So you can hook into something with template redirect and then you can utilize conditionals like uh, so you can find out hey where am I on uh, what kind of page have, am I am I loading or what kind of what kind of URL is being loaded here so that I know what to do and you can do special things based on those conditionals. So template redirects super handy for uh, certain WordPress theming actions. Um, Actions and filters, they're super important. It's a key function of the way WordPress works, the way you really start to shine in your WordPress theme development. Uh, if you're building parent themes, make those parent themes filterable. Um, if you are scared by the way actions and filters work, I highly recommend, uh, this is like the super duper intro to a filter. Pippin Williamson has a quick introduction using filters that I have linked in the slides. Um, and then when you're ready to go a little more advanced, the different types of filters, different types of hooks, understanding the differences. Um, I think this is also a Pip, uh, one of Pippin's tutorials that he did on Touch Plus uh, where he talks about writing extensible plugins with actions and filters. 
And this is just as applicable t for WordPress themes, especially if you're making a theme available for distribution uh, or one that you want other developers to utilize for their projects. Because uh, if you want somebody to utilize your parent theme or framework or whatever you want to call it uh, for their client work, then you really need to make it super flexible for them. Uh, but you want to do that without making everything so abstract that it's impossible to navigate the theme. Um, I can't tell you how many older projects I've uh, opened up and seen, you know, direct uh, scripts into the th template files or uh, CSS files that are linked right in the header uh, versus being properly enqueued. Uh, WordPress has an, uh, a system with the WP and Q scripts so that you can uh, easily uh, register and enqueue scripts and styles. And basically what that means is it makes it easy for you to be able to um, register something, but if someone else, as in another plugin, uh, or maybe it's the parent theme if you're doing this in a child theme, if they've already registered and enqueued that exact script um, or, or style sheet by the same handle, then it's not going to re-enqueue it, so you're you're limiting what you bring in. This is what prevents you from downloading ten different versions of jQuery um, in your theme. So WP and Q scripts, you have to use it. If you're not using WP and Q scripts to to include your scripts and and your styles, then you're absolutely doing it wrong. And I encourage you to uh, to look at these tutorials. The one in WP Candy is one I wrote a couple years ago. Uh, the Touch Plus one goes into something similar. Hopefully. Uh, those will help you out. I personally recommend registering and then enqueuing. Uh, the reason for this is because it gives you more flexibility. You can enqueue right there in the same hook. Uh, you can also wait. You can uh, register it and then you can enqueue just with the handle so you don't have to include all the other parameters if you're using uh, enqueue instead of register for those scripts. And then the other thing is you can, as of I think two or three versions of WordPress ago, um, you can enqueue a script right in a template file and it'll allow it to be uh, uh, loaded into the footer of the theme. So that's super helpful like if you write a custom short code or something uh, you can have the, the short code or you can have the script or the style uh, registered but then you're not actually loading that script until it's necessary meaning that it's in your short code. Uh, Mike Jolly just wrote, MikeJolly.com just wrote a re uh, tutorial recently that was uh, a good example of, of doing that uh, in, a, in a custom shortcode. Uh, and most of the time you can load this stuff in the footer. There's just no reason to put stuff uh, above the header that's going to prevent uh, more important things from happening before those scripts and styles. Uh, theme setup functions are something that still are really uh, relatively um, uncommon, even in some, in some high quality WordPress themes. A custom setup function basically uh, the majority of uh, those jokes are killing me in the chat room right now. Basically, the majority of hooks can be attached to uh, before theme setup, after theme setup, these various things. Typically, after theme setup is a good place to to put a lot of these hooks. So, if you're hooking into a knit, uh, which is pretty late in the process, uh, you can add add action init and your custom function into the uh, after theme setup with a certain priority. Uh, Justin Tadlock has a fantastic example of how in his parent theme he reg he does a theme setup function on priority 9 and then in his default child themes he does a theme setup function with priority 11 uh, which means for most of the types of things that he would uh, instantiate um, in his parent theme it makes it so that the person in the child theme on priority 11 uh, can you know uh, remove action or DQ or whatever they want to do within that theme setup function. So those priorities are important. That's super handy. Uh, check that out. Uh, loading files. I'm going to have a lot of Justin Tadlock references. I just need to give a quick shout out to Justin Tadlock. I probably learned, uh, I don't know, 60, 70 percent at least of what I know about WordPress themes from Justin Tadlock. The dude is a freaking genius. Uh, he's so thoughtful in the way that he structures his, his themes and his code and his tutorials are first rate. So. There's to Justin, fellow Alabama guy, uh, War Eagle. Let's hope we win the SEC championship this weekend. Uh, loading files. 
so Justin also has a fantastic tutorial about loading files and referencing those files. Um, so referencing uh, child theme uh, through the uh, uh, get style sheet uh, directory uh, URI versus uh, get template directory URI. Uh, template directory is going to reference the parent theme. Style sheet is going to reference the child theme. Uh, this is actually a thing from uh, the theme perspective that maybe some plugin developers need to pay attention to. Be careful if you're referencing something in a theme for some reason from a plugin um, that you're paying attention to whether you're referencing the parent or the child. And there's also some other handy stuff that he's got in here about uh, how Git template part works uh, and how uh, some other things with, in regards to uh, like locate template and uh, uh, other functions in terms of loading files, what's important. Um, so WordPress URLs. The URL in WordPress is super important because basically once the UR, once WordPress reads the URL, uh, WordPress itself takes that URL and then it puts it through this just absolute magic code uh, in the, I believe, the rewrite API, uh, and it figures out what it's going to portray, and t meaning uh, what is the WP query object that's going to return on that page. Um, so that's the same WP query object that you would then be able to alter. So the, the URL says one thing, and then pre get post is a hook after that that you can uh, hook in there to alter what it thinks it should deliver. Um, but understand the very basics of the re, uh, rewrite API so that you understand the importance of what the URLs are, what they do, and how they function. Uh, probably the most important thing um, in uh, in WordPress theming is loops. Uh, understand the default WordPress loop. Uh, that's going to be in pretty much every single template. Um, and then uh, also WP query custom queries. Uh, do, if you're not if you're not writing your custom queries with WP query, um, you need to be careful. Uh, you definitely don't want to be using query posts. I think most people are familiar with that by now. Uh, but also, uh, git post is essentially a wrapper to WP query. Uh, and as long as people have been doing these custom loops, this could be pulling posts in the sidebar, pulling posts related below a post, basically, uh, or pulling a slider. Anything you want to pull data from that's not the default WordPress loop, you're probably going to be using WP query. Andrew Nason gave an incredible talk uh, that was called uh, You Don't Know Query. So check that out on WordPress.tv. Watch it two, three, four times. Seriously, you'll get value out of it every time. Uh, one pet peeve of mine, WP Reset Post Data versus WP Reset Query. A lot of people use WP Reset Query at the end of a WP Query, and it's really not necessary because what you're doing with WP Reset Query, it does what WP Reset Post Data does, except it also uh, resets the WP query global uh, variable back to its original. So you're essentially doing something that's unnecessary because you should have been doing that WP query in its own little custom variable anyway, like my custom query equals new WP query. Uh, and another handy little trick, I think a WP query hits the database four times, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, both update post meta cache and update post term cache, if those aren't necessary, if you're doing a simple loop, you can set those to false in your uh, parameters for WP Query, and each of those cuts uh, one of the hits to the database. So you can uh, cut the uh, the weight of that query in half, uh, just like that. Uh, and then pre-get post is the way that you really should be altering the loop when you do it. Um, pre-get post is pretty simple to use. Basically, like I said before, you're just telling WP Query um, that you want to do something a little bit different uh, than what the URL is telling WordPress uh, to do. Um, the key there is to make sure that you're paying attention to the main query. Uh, you also want to pay, make sure that you're not in the admin unless you want to be. Um, the, the action reference page on the codex is pretty good for pre-get posts, but uh, if you've ever thought you have to use query posts, you really don't. Uh, you probably do it with pre-get posts, so uh, get to know that function. Uh, post meta, sometimes I'll uh, see a template in a, in a WordPress theme, and it's just got git post meta written 50 times down the, down the template. Um, if you're running into a situation like that, you can probably simplify how you're calling that metadata a little bit. Git post custom gets all available metadata 
um, for WordPress, so you don't have to call Git post meta every single time. And then you can use a little bit simpler of a syntax for assigning each of the various uh, pieces of meta and um, and using those in the template, so you can have a little simpler uh, structure for that. Uh, another pet peeve of mine with post meta and WordPress themes is sometimes people don't check that something exists before they output it. So let's just say you're taking some post meta and you're putting it in a paragraph tag. Um, it's really good to check for the meta before you output an empty paragraph tag because if there's no meta, your paragraph tag is going to be empty. You only want to output the meta, you only want to output the paragraph tag if the meta exists. Uh, so check for existence of that meta before you output it. Um, that's something that's it causes a lot of funky display issues when the client ends up not inputting data the way you anticipate that they will. There are classes and tools available for post meta as well. Uh, Advanced Custom Fields has really come on strong. It's probably one of the favorites out there. Uh, it's got a UI, but it's also got a really, um, a really solid uh, API of its own for, for calling and grabbing data, uh, doing things with it. It has a lot of different types of uh, custom fields that really enhance the editing experience for your clients. Uh, Pods is very similar, very, very advanced, more advanced than Advanced Custom Fields. Um, and also has a lot of powerful stuff built in. Um, it's almost got two power a lot of times for client projects that I've worked on. Uh, I used CMB for a long time, and then uh, a coworker of mine actually forked it, uh, made it better, and uh, we used that for a long time after that and had more fields in it. And uh, But CMB is a pretty good starting place. It's just a class that you can drop into an existing WordPress plugin or theme. Um, but if you're new to this, I would definitely be checking out this metamorphosis metamorphosis project. Uh, it looks like at least there's going to be a plugin that comes about, but WordPress core could actually finally end up uh, with its own little um, uh, Metabox class or some sort of mechanism for, for people to utilize core itself to better create uh, editing areas for their clients. Um, so let's get a little unicorny and talk about design. Um, Design is an important aspect of theme development. It's important for a developer to understand design, to be able to see design, understand how it affects various things. And let's start with responsive design. Really with responsive design, I would say either do it right or don't do it. I've seen some totally jacked up websites because responsive design was done so poorly. Uh, some quick tips, things to pay attention to are menus and comments and things that you don't expect like how, what's going to happen when somebody tries to slap ads in this website or an iframe or something. Uh, a lot can go wrong, so if you're developing a WordPress theme for distribution, uh, definitely pay attention to that. Um, I've got this meta tag in there. That meta tag that sets the initial scale to 1 is what tells a mobile device to go ahead and zoom in uh, for um, a, a responsive design it, because normally a device would say, oh, this website's 1,100 pixels wide. Let's zoom out so that we can see the whole thing. Uh, this meta tag in the header is actually uh, telling it to go ahead and zoom in to one. What this doesn't have is the, uh, the I think it's a max device width or something like that because what that does is it prevents zooming. You don't want to do that. This meta tag here, very simple, does the trick. Someone can still zoom. It's very nice. I also like in uh, if you if you have a parent theme where someone doing the child theme might try to make it unresponsive. You see sometimes uh, is make that meta tag filterable in the header because then it makes it easier for someone to make it so it will zoom out. Because sometimes when you see someone develop a child theme and they don't want it to be responsive, when you go on to it on mobile, it still zooms way in. So if you make that filterable and then put it in your docs, you can pretty easily. Uh, you know, get that meta tag out of there so it'll zoom back out. Um, if you're not doing mobile first, you may want to put your responsive stuff in a separate style sheet. It really depends. Uh, if you're doing mobile first, if you're doing a preprocessor, uh, preprocessor you can separate everything in your SAS or less files and then compile it all to one. That's really amazing. That's really the future as well. Um, but if you're not there yet and, and you're not doing mobile first, so basically if you're a year or so behind on responsive design, then uh, yeah, maybe put that responsive style sheet in a separate CSS file, and that way it's pretty easy to for someone down the road to remove the meta file, remove the DQ responsive style sheet, and boom, they're not responsive. 
And the only reason I really bring this up, because it's not something I recommend, I just bring it up because I've seen a lot of broken responsive websites where someone started with a responsive theme and then customized it and it's not so responsive and it also looks like crap on mobile. Um, and I wrote a post about considering navigation. It's kind of the same type of thing if you want to change where your breakpoint is or depending, depending on how you're uh, wanting to trigger a mobile navigation. Uh, there's a, a post on, on post status linked up here about some of the things to consider and I really like the way that the underscores theme is doing it now. Uh, and breakpoints are arbitrary. I, I, I don't like seeing people have one, two, three breakpoints um, where you know, like you feel like you got to bust, you know, uh, squeeze everything into into those breakpoints. Uh, put in a breakpoint when you need a breakpoint to make the website look better. If your breakpoint in the header needs to be uh, 800 pixels, but really you should be doing these breakpoints in M's, uh, and then your your I just can't do that conversion. Sorry. And then your breakpoint in your content area needs to be at 600. Do it. Don't you don't have to squeeze them both on 700 and it looks like crap on. Uh, 100 pixels either direction. Just put a breakpoint in when you need a breakpoint. I don't know how I developed uh, websites before box sizing border box. Uh, asterisk box sizing border box. This basically changes the game in terms of padding. If you have not done this and you don't have to support IE7, which God, I, I have great sympathies for you if you have to support IE7, uh, this is supported by IE8 and above. Uh, in all modern browsers, box sizing border box, and there's a couple, you know, uh, browser prefixes that you do with that as well, is amazing. It changes your life. 50%, 50% is always going to be 50%, 50%. So when you do 2% padding, that goes in, not out. It makes your life so much easier as a theme developer. Paul Irish, uh, that little post that was relatively short, technology has been around a lot longer, but he just kind of like made it click for everybody, and it's wonderful. Uh, SVG versus icon fonts versus fallback uh, pings. Um, this is something that's debatable for a lot of people and, and, and how they work. Um, it really depends on browser support that's required. It depends on what you need in the icon or whatever you're using it for. Um, if it's flat, then icon fonts are really handy. If the browser support uh, isn't, you don't have too much fallback or you know, there's not, um, you know, there's not, uh, if the icon font or the, the, the image itself, if it's not too necessary, um, then icon fonts can be great because if they go away, nothing really changes. SVG uh, is great for more advanced uh, icons, more advanced logos or something like that. And if you're using SVG and you need IE8 support, then you can have... Uh, uh, fallback pings, uh, and there's some ways with Modernizer to basically just have a class so that you can have a dot no SVG uh, logo and then have a fallback ping um, for that. And, and with CSS, it doesn't load if it doesn't recognize the class that's being utilized, so your modern browsers wouldn't ever even try to load that. Uh, browser support and all these things are very important. Can I use .com? Amazing. Just do it. Go there if you're not sure what's going on. Um, more general principles of theme development, and uh, we're going to get going even faster here. Uh, let plugins take care of what they're good at. If you need breadcrumbs on a project, if you need pagination on a project, um, it just depends on the project. You know, Sometimes theme frameworks, if you're utilizing one of those, they'll have it, but it may not be fully extensible. Uh, I've no, I know I've run into this before. I've used uh, Hybrid Core on a lot of projects, and you know, before the breadcrumbs weren't quite what I needed, so I ended up using uh, Yoast WordPress SEO breadcrumbs that he has in there. Um, if you're trying to build a theme with you know SEO ready or whatever, just make the theme use best practices and let an SEO plugin do the rest, um, and utilize that philosophy for a lot of things. If there's a plugin that's doing something great. Uh, there's this really great parody that you can create between a WordPress theme and plugins. Uh, Michael Fields has a fantastic um, presentation that he did at WordCamp San Francisco 2012 um, where he talks about the communication between uh, themes and plugins and the beauty that can exist there. So look up that presentation and I'll try to add it to this, uh, this slide deck when I publish it. Uh, just analyze each situation and, and keep that in mind when you're developing your project. Um, 
This is just like a note that we all kind of need to know. Functions.php is not a landfill. Um, it's not a dumping ground for all your code crap uh, that you have in your project. Um, it's a really easy scapegoat, but we really need to think about what am I putting in functions.php? Is that something that this client, if they no longer utilize this design, they're going to want to take with them? And if they're going to want to take it with them, it really belongs in a plugin. Whether you have a site-specific plugin or if you have reusable functionality plugins, like say you do bios all the time or you do a slider all the time or you do whatever all the time, uh, you, those can be specific plugins, and then you can maybe have a site-specific plugin that's like just uh, regular old uh, code that they're going to want to take with them uh, because it's custom to their, their website. Um, so yeah, tr really prevent functions.php from becoming a, land file, uh, a landfill. If you get over, I don't know, I don't know if I want to give it a specific line number, if you get over maybe five, eight, hundred, a thousand lines of code, uh, you might want to consider some of that code that's in your functions file. Um, in your theme development, stay dry. Uh, don't repeat yourself. Um, whether it's uh, creating bylines, whether it's uh, some custom piece of functionality, maybe like an author bio or something at the end of the templates. Um, if you notice that you're repeating yourself over and over again, put that into a function, put it in a template part, and then just call it when necessary. Because then when you upgrade that, um, you, you can easily change that piece of code and it uh, distributes itself throughout your theme. And don't be afraid to put options in those functions either. So that say you have a long byline and a short byline, you can create an option for your byline that's long or short and then you still call the same function anywhere that you utilize it. Um, so just stay dry. If you uh, use the same piece of code a second time, that's when you need to stop and say, do I need to put this uh, somewhere where I can reuse it better? Use things that WordPress gives you. Uh, the customizer for uh, settings is really fantastic versus options pages. The settings API, if you really need it. Um, other APIs that WordPress gives you, utilize them when you got them. Uh, same thing with like scripts and stuff. Uh, you know, if WordPress has a, a a script bundled with it, use that script. Don't and put your own in the theme and and pull that in. Um, testing always test your code. Always test uh, your themes throughout development because if you do it at the end, uh, you could end up with quite a few things that you have to fix and and then you won't want to. Then you could get lazy. You could have a deadline and then you end up not doing it. That's not good. So just always have WP debug on. WPTest.io is a really fantastic theme unit testing uh, framework that just dumps all sorts of stuff in your theme. Monster Widget just uh, slaps every widget you can possibly imagine into the into your sidebar all in one little widget, um, and you can test things. And there's lots of stuff that you may not recognize, like maybe you're not properly handling images, so if you have a really big image in your sidebar, it all of a sudden overflows. I recommend doing these things even for client work because you never know what somebody might down the road put into this uh, theme that you're creating for a client. Um, so you really, I, I think we should have a mentality of creating themes for clients the same way that we cre create themes for distribution, uh, even though it's uh, distributed only to the one client. Uh, the developer plugin, super handy, bundles a bunch of other plugins. Monitor queries helps you uh, see how heavy the page is, how many queries. Uh, to the database uh, you've got and all sorts of other stuff that people are really loving that plugin right now. Uh, Chrome Inspector, check out the waterfall, see what's taking a lot of time. Maybe you have a massive image and you don't need it or you can sprite it or you know you can do various things. You can see how long your page is loading. Um, browser support, keep browser support in mind always. Uh, I wrote a post on this where I was kind of whining about uh, the way some people in the WordPress community are, are, are looking at browser support. Supporting IE doesn't make very much sense because IE 10, IE 11, those are modern browsers. IE 9 is way different from IE 10. IE 8 is way different from IE 9. If someone's on Windows XP, they might just be stuck on IE 8, and that really sucks, and we would like them to use Chrome, but they might not be able to. If your client is on XP, they could be using IE 8, and you didn't even look at it when you were developing the project that they paid you five, ten, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 for. Uh, one of the most important things I can say uh, in this presentation is learn from the greats. Uh, nobody really starts from scratch. Underscore started as a thousand hour theme. 
it's probably the 10,000 hour theme at this point. It's really fantastic code. It's always changing. You can fork underscores and utilize it for your projects, or you just learn from it for your own themes that you're creating. Uh, Stargazer is a new theme that Justin Tadlock created where he's really utilizing a lot of uh, uh, WordPress things that are available to him, and it's kind of a catch-all, does-everything theme that can be customized. There's a lot that you can learn from that theme, whether you like the design or not, um, and it really integrates a lot of the things that Justin's done through the, the past, and I'm really looking forward to digging more into that theme. And then the default themes. Uh, so much work goes into 2014, 2013, 2012, 2011, all the way back to 2010. Uh, when 2010 first came out, man, lots of people use that as a framework all in itself. Um, so uh, look at these themes, learn from them, see what they're updating even. Uh, it's really, uh, can't, can't overstate how important that is to learn from people that are doing fantastic things with WordPress themes. Uh, now I'm just going to fly right through these. Uh, these are tools that I really love, and I'll have these available. Uh, CodeKit helps you minify files. It, it lets you see live updates locally, checks for errors in your CSS and JavaScript, and you have more than you think. Uh, and it compiles preprocessors. So if you're using SAS or less, which I highly recommend, I'm really enjoying uh, developing client sites with SAS. Um, and then with SAS, you can use something like Compass or Bourbon for mix-ins. Uh, this is like Codename Central, uh, and I was really averse to that for a long time. But I personally like SAS with Bourbon. Uh, and then there's even Neat on top of that. Yes, yeah, ridiculous how many levels these you know these fancy names nest um, but that's got like a, a, a grid and all sorts of fancy stuff with it uh, really beautiful what preprocessors can do and how much they can uh, help you clean up your your CSS and a lot of times the deeper we get into a project the dirtier our CSS gets um, look at foundation or look at frameworks like UI frameworks to see how they're how they're doing uh, foundation by Zurb is really fantastic um, Twitter bootstrap's very good, uh, it's maybe a little more out of vogue now than it was a year ago, um, but there's a lot of uh, fancy code in those and there's a lot that we can learn, they're very modern, uh, but don't try to update it every time you, you know, uh, Twitter bootstrap or, or foundation updates. You can keep your theme a little further back if you want, because backwards compatibility is a little more important in my opinion, and, and those tend to develop on like a underscores method to where it doesn't really keep uh, backwards compatibility in check. Uh, there's some handy JavaScript stuff that you can look at. There's a website that I couldn't remember with, but or I couldn't remember, but um, it's got a bunch of these on there. But Flex Sliders, uh, great if you're going to do sliders, which is unfortunate. Carol Fred Cell for carousels, and if you're not, if you can't do what you need with the car uh, for, uh, with the carousel and Flex Slider uh, for validation and forms, uh, Yoast has a great article on this. Check out Field Validation that I linked up there. But this jQuery validation plugin, I was just playing with it the other day. It's really fantastic for uh, doing inline quick um, validation uh, with jQuery. It's super easy. I was amazed how easy it is, and you know, you just all of us. It's super, super simple to tell someone, "Hey, that's not a real email," or "Hey, this needs to be more than five characters," or whatever. Uh, for icon fonts, dash icons, generic icons, font awesome. Uh, definitely start with those. Dash icons ship with WordPress, so that's awesome if that's all you need. Generic icons have a little bit more. Uh, Font Awesome is like super loaded with all sorts of icon fonts, and they're really fantastic. Uh, for typefaces, I really love typography.com. This is uh, Hoffler, Frere, Jones, or however you pronounce it, H&FJ. This is their web typography product. I use this on post status, and I freaking love it. It's beautiful typography. Uh, it's worth every penny. Uh, and... Uh, Typekit is also fantastic by Adobe, and then if you're looking for some free fonts, uh, Google fonts are obviously great. Um, but don't forget your typefaces. Even you developers out there, uh, typography means a ton in a theme, so if you want to play with design and you're not, you don't find yourself to be a designer, uh, go look and study typefaces. See what designers are using for typefaces, and maybe start with that for your first design. Um, for version control, Beanstalk's fantastic for uh, deployment. That's what we use at range. Uh, versions and Tower for you non-command liners like me uh, on Mac. Uh, those are both fantastic tools for having a, a visual um, view uh, for SVN and Git. Uh, and then when you're working locally, uh, when I joined range, I, I got on to uh, VVV. Uh, this is a, a Vagrant. Uh, base local product that was um, it's maintained by 10up um, uh, Jeremy 
I'm forgetting Jeremy's last name right now. Um, now with the University of Washington uh, originally created, it's really fantastic. Uh, that's how I've got my entire like local setup. Uh, now Mant Pro uh, is good if you're afraid of VVV. Uh, server Press if you need a hosted product. VIP Quick Start if you got uh, VIP customers for like WordPress.com VIP. Uh, and then so just some sites and code snippets. Template tags page on the Codex can't live without it. QueryPost.com. Uh, an alternative for to, for looking up WordPress functions and hooks and whatnot, uh, and digging quicker into the source. It's another one by Rars. It's really fantastic. AdamBrown.info for WordPress hooks. Bill Erickson's got tons of code snippets that are amazing. GeneratewP.com has lots of little code snippets that are great. Themergency.com for generators, especially for taxonomy and custom post type generators. Uh, WordPress Stack Exchange is probably one of the premier sources if you're going to have a Q&A type of site that you rely on. Uh, there's a lot of great information there. There's some world-class WordPress developers that spend a lot of time and invest a lot of time into that website. Um, SpriteCal, if you need to create spi uh, sprites, makes it super freaking easy. Just upload a sprite and then get your background positions and whatnot really, really quickly. It's 145. WordPress theming best practices for client-centric web development. I'll try to get these links posted somewhere for you guys soon. Thanks for joining me.